My name is Juliana Nicolasian with the Oklahoma State University Library. Also with me today is John Laffey. And we're here today to interview Wally Funk as part of the O State Stories Oral History Project. We're here in Texas today visiting with Ms. Funk, and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for coming, and it's a joy to meet both of you. Well, Wally, I want to begin by learning a little bit more about you. Could you tell us where you were born, where you grew up? Wow. Well, where I came from was <clears throat> I was born and raised in Taos, New Mexico, and that's the northern part of New Mexico at 7,000 feet. So, of course, I was on skis at th year, three years of age. I learned to do everything early in my life. I had very, very forward-thinking parents that allowed me to go out and do whatever I wanted to do because the story of the glorious Taos Mountain that was normally in snow most of the year Mother said that mountain has the spirit and you take that spirit in and you use it and go in your life and do everything and anything you want to do because you're never going to stop. And to this day, I can tell you, I can go higher, faster, longer than most people. And with that little bit of information that mother gave me, and I was always out running, riding my horse, riding my bike, shooting my BB guns, playing with the Indians. Those were the Taos Indians because they, the, Christine and Ben would always come into the house and take care of, Christine would take care of the house and Ben would take care of the outside. And they would teach me Tiwa, which was Indian language. And I would go back and forth to the Pueblo on the back of their horse-drawn carriage because mother would let me go. I, I walked and ran everywhere. I mean, you just walk to school for a couple miles. It's no big deal, even when I was little. So I guess you're going to get into the flying part, so let's just jump ahead to when I'm five, ahead, five years old. Okay, great. <laughs> My parents had given me a Superman cape. I had a horse called Victor Palomino. And I'd have to have a box for me to get on the box and swing my leg over to either go on bareback or in the saddle. Or if mother wasn't there, I'd go to the fence, climb up the fence, and then get on the horse. Okay. This day, I got my Superman cape on, and I put some hay down at the back of the barn because I didn't want mother to film me. She had filmed me all my life. And I got up there, and I... Jumped off the barn, waggled my wings, but nothing happened. Uh oh, something's wrong here. So I did it again, got up there, jumped off the barn, wiggled my wings, and I went right into the hay. So that was my start. At eight years of age, my parents saw that I got an airplane ride, and that took off. I made model airplanes, all of them were hanging on the ceiling, and those were the days that you used a razor blade and cut out all the balsa wood wings, the fuselage, and then you glued things together, and then you wrapped them up with tissue paper. And then I didn't have one of those things that you spray water. They, they weren't made yet, but I remember Mother had an atomizer. I didn't, I didn't know the word atomizer back then. I poured her precious perfume out, filled it up with water, and I used that on the tissue paper to make everything top. Then I could paint it. Now in old times I could say, I would dope the airplane. I don't use that word anymore because people don't understand. That was the name of airplane paint back in the 40s. So I, different colors. So I had a great time making all my airplanes, all different type. Father, who had a 5 and 10, would bring me model airplanes home. And you can't imagine a kid having a razor blade cutting it, and I never hurt myself. Then I got into wood making. There were people that did chairs and stools and things like that, and I learned from them how to um, make things, make candlestick holders. Um, I did tree houses, and then I would sleep in them. 
And I tell my parents, okay, I'm going to sleep in the treehouse for the summer, or maybe I'll make something in the barn. Or maybe I'm doing a tent and I sleep outside. So I, I had freedom, absolute freedom. The swimming pool at Taos was way across town and it was a warm water pool. I would walk it, I would go on my horse, or I'd ride my bike, it didn't matter. Whatever transportation I could come up with, because mother was busy doing her thing in town. She was kind of the aristocrat lady, in, in with all the women's things that they did. She wanted me to be a rainbow girl. Well, I said, I'll try it. So I had to have a formal on and go to the meetings on Thursday nights and stay very astutely and repeat whenever I was asked to say something. Well, one night, gun club was that same night. And when I was shooting my 22, I had my t-shirt on and a pair of Levi's and I went to the rainbows that way. And as soon as I walked in and took my position, they said, I think you can leave now. <laughs> and I said, yeah, <laughs> I didn't want to do that. So that was kind of a disappointment to mother. And then another little disappointment, she wanted my coming out party to be in New York. And I said, no, no more formals. Hmm. I, I was in Levi's and t-shirts most of all my life. Then came time, they realized the school system in Taos was probably not the greatest to me get my education. So they took me out after being a junior and sent me off to Stevens College on the train from Santa Fe, the Stevens College train, to go to Columbia, Missouri. Did you have any family in Missouri? No. Stevens College was a girls' college of 2,000 2, girls. How old were you when you made the trip? Uh, 15, 16. Wow. So the, the train started in California, had all the Steve and Susie's picked up along the way. So I was picked up in Santa Fe. How did your family make the decision to go to that particular college? Good question. Stevens was very smart. They sent their men out to various towns in the United States to see who's interest, who's, who would be interested in sending your child to Stevens College, Missouri, in Columbia, Missouri. And my parents had known of two girls that had gone from Taos, and they loved it. So of course, yay, yes, I want to go. So the man came, interviewed my parents, interviewed me, and all I wanted to do was be outside and he says, you're accepted. So I got on the Steve and Susie train and met some of the girls. And some of those girls from California had long hair and all kinds of wow types of dresses. I had a proper little suit on and fingernail polish, smoked. I had never been around any of that. My parents didn't smoke, that we didn't drink. I, I was brought up, mother says, if you drink anything, it's gotta be water. And to this day, that's all I drink. I've tried coffee, I've tried liquor, doesn't do a thing for me. Anyway, I get to Stevens, and then you're taken to your dorm with your trunk, and the one thing that you have to have is linen and one white dress for church, because you have to go to church every Sunday, and you get a grade on it. So I was made an A in the church. <laughs> and then they gave you your um, schedule of the classes you're to take, because you've got to remember now, I'm going as a, really a youngster, and all these other girls might be 18, 19, and had a little bit of better education than I did. So I was just kind of going along, doing the best I could. Father always helped me with my math. Mother always helped me with my English. And I read comic books. <laughs> so about halfway through, no, about after the first year. First year, 
I was an Olympic skier before I went to Stevens, and I wanted to get home at Christmas time to come on skiing. Sure. And when that happened, unfortunately, they had a new tow to take you up. And they had not put the uh, bars across the <coughs> cable. And my weight was just enough being a, um, I was a person that helped people on the chair, chair lifts and on the um, skiing if they ever needed help. The toe went up. It, it broke. And I went up 20 feet and, and obviously fell down to the ground. I broke my back. I didn't realize it at the time. So I laid there in the snow saying, hey, you guys, I can't get up. I can't get up. I think the wind's been knocked out of me. So I laid there for almost an hour. And finally, they lifted me up and took me down. There was no such thing as emergencies. Uh, cars in those days. I sat up while they took me from the ski run, Taos ski run, to our home in Taos. Mother took me right away to the hospital, and then they found out that I'd broken my back. So I went back to Stevens that first year in a half cast. Well, that was kind of boring because <laughs> I did all kinds of athletic stuff. That's what was my, my first semester. So all I could do is be on the sidelines and try to study a little more. Okay, that comes, that's done and gone. This summer I come back and I'm back on my horse, I'm making airplanes and so forth, and then we have to go back for the second year. My advisor, Dr. Bates, called mother up as soon as I got to school. Mrs. Funk, would you let Wally fly? She said, absolutely, start her tomorrow. Now, is this curriculum they offered at the yes, college? Yes, absolutely. Did you know that going there? No. Okay. Or I'd been at the first year <laughs> instead of the second year. Stevens College was, was um, participated in all the NIFA events, mm -hmm. and I flew a, many cross countries that second year. I was in the Air Mate that first that second year, and did very well. I was in a Cessna 120. It was a tail wheel aircraft. And I loved it. All my grades came up. Uh, it was popular. Uh, it was great. Then my parents, it's only a two year college now. Mm -hmm. My folks said, okay, uh, we want you to go to Indiana University or you can go to Hawaii or you, wherever you would like to go. I said, I'm going to Oklahoma State. They have the best flight team in the United States because I've been to the NIFA events. And is that how you found out about OSU? That is correct. Hmm. So I had father had other plans, but I didn't. I said, please take me to Oklahoma State and Tyner Lashley and another young lady that I have known, Sally Broyles, said we'll take care of her. I lived with Sally, she was an instructor. And Tyner got me all squared away with all my flight for that summer. So I had my private at Stevens, and at Oklahoma State I got my commercial instrument flight instructors, and I got my ATP and uh, airline transport rating later on in California. But I got all my ratings there. I flew for the Flying Aggies for two years. We brought in the trophies like nobody's business. Well, let's talk about the the Flying Aggies while you were there. Tell me about the makeup of the club, how large it was. The, you had Hoyt, Tyner, Sally. I can't, I can't remember all the other instructors. Mm -hmm. We were schooled and we practiced every Saturday and Sunday. Now, there are four types of events. There were takeoffs, <clears throat> landings. You take off, you come around the pattern, and they would have a line across, and you would do either power on or power off landings. So, the first one was cut your power and glide to the landing point. Now, this takes a lot of knowledge because you have winds to put up with, crosswinds to put up with, and the gliding of the aircraft. So then, 
after you finish that scenario, they would put us on power on landings. Well, those were kind of easy because you could come in and land on the your two wheels and leave your tail up, and we were in Aronicus. Uh, those were fabric aircraft. Number six, that was the one I flew. <laughs> and number four. So anyway, then you do your power on landings. Then the next day, we had bomb drop. They don't call it that now, they call it message drop. Bomb drop. We had um, a flour sack, no, a sack with five pounds of flour in it, each one of us. So I would open my door, we have a pilot and I was a bombardier. I would open up the door and just as we're starting to approach at 100 feet, the target on the ground, I'd whomp that thing down and hit the point because you had to put in winds and the speed of the aircraft that could be for you or against you. So we did bomb drop, then we did na navigation. Actually, navigation is now first. So they said, okay, you're gonna go from here to here to here to here. So you gotta draw out your chart, take off, get your time, and make this route. And you want to make it precisely to the time that you said that you would do it. And Tyner had a great way of having us putting our checkpoints and our time down, and I use that form to this day. If I'd known you were gonna ask, I'd have got, gone in there and gotten it for you. And it works. So uh, the best instruction I could have ever had was with Tyner. And Gary Hartzell, who lives not far away from here, uh, I was an Alpha Chi Omega, and I didn't quite like all the frou-frou stuff that they wanted us to do with the dances and so forth, so the second year I did one of the dorms, and I was flying all the time. Oh, at the Alpha Chi house, when they had us dance, I'd do one dance and go up to my room, <laughs> change my clothes, and get out the window, and go to the airport, and Gary Hartzell would meet me there. And he says, okay, we're gonna get in the champ, all number four, and we're gonna go flying, nighttime. It's okay. So we take off, and he says, go up to 2,000 feet, okay? We're over the airport. He says, I want you to go over the airport. And they switched off the mags. We had no electricity in those days. You had to hand prop your aircraft. No lights, no radio, no anything. So I'm up there, I said, okay, it's an emergency. He says, what I want you to do is I want you to circle down and land at Stillwater Airport. I don't care what runway you use. Tyner had taught me so well that I circled and stayed within the confines of the runway and landed. And Gary never got over that. That girl could do that. And I call him my airport brother, and we'll talk every once in a while on the phone. So if you ever get a hold of Gary, says, your airport girl told us about the emergency. But I learned so much from that, and I do that today with my kids. Not at night, but over an airport during the day. So Oklahoma State was, <clears throat> I knew I could do anything because I just had that feeling. Well, were there, were there a lot of women in the Flying Aggies at that time? Uh, three that I can recall, mm -hmm. and I don't remember the names. I don't, they, they were not as gung-ho <laughs> and as, uh, I was very blessed with having and knowing how to do things correctly and right on and multitask right away. I mean, you could pull the engine on anywhere and, and I could get it down. Most people can't do that. You were also an officer in the club. Could you tell us a little bit about that and how that came about? <laughs> I don't remember what an <laughs> officer it was. <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't, I can't. If you remember, maybe you could jar my mind. All I've seen was you were an officer. It never said what position you held or... It probably was a flying position. Okay. Because I... I, I have always been my own taskmaster. I've 
pretty much lived by myself all my life. I've had a couple of roommates, but the way you see all the aviation around in my house here, people couldn't handle it. They wanted their stuff too, which was trinkety stuff. Mm -hmm. I'm not a trinkety person. I'm an airplane person. <laughs> <laughs> anything on the history? Anything else you want to cover? I just want to say, Oklahoma State gave me the knowledge, the think-aheadness for me to have become what I am now and to get into space. Now, we didn't know about space then, but when it came up and Jerry Cobb called me, which we'll get to in a minute, I said, yes. That was at Oklahoma and the spirit of that Taos Mountain. Yes, you got to do it. Do you remember how many actual members total? Uh, approximately, I know you can't. Was it a very large club at the time of the Flying Aggies? No, I don't think we had more than <clears throat> 15. Right around 15. So, you look at a picture. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. While you're going to OSU, what's your major? <laughs> Secondary <laughs> education. <laughs> I wanted to be a make, um, a um, engineer or uh, auto mechanics. Sure. You can't do that. You're a girl. I thought, what's wrong with that picture? Why not? You're a girl. So that has kept me out of NASA. If I'd had my engineering degree, I would have got into NASA. I have four letters of recommendation and try to get into NASA. I didn't have that engineering degree. Hmm. And I've been sorry about that, but there was nothing, you know? I, the Indians taught me something. When something doesn't go your way, you throw it a fish. So you'll hear me say that every once in a while. When you can't make something happen for you, it's absolutely impossible, you throw it a fish and walk on. And no, that's not the right time. Go ahead. Well, you, you earned many, many ratings at OSU during your time there. That's correct. And so I want you to kind of walk me through what happens after you leave OSU. Well, I graduated, and my roommate was from Fort Sill, Pat, Pat Connor, and she said, come on down and spend the summer with me at Fort Sill. So my father was a colonel there. I said, yeah, that's great. So off we went and I put everything in storage, as I recall. And I went down, and her father was very hard. And he says, what are you girls going to do? Oh, we're just going to play. He says, no. I'm not going to have two girls in my house just playing and going swimming and doing things that you want to do. Patsy, you go out there and, because she was a horsewoman, mm -hmm. you go out there and take care of the horses. Wally, you go out to the airport and get a job. And that's exactly what both of us did. She got a job there. I got a job teaching the military at Fort Sill. And as I progressed with my knowledge that Tyner had given me, and I was in airplanes that I had never flown before, but I had the knowledge to where I could get in it, taxi back and forth, and go do it. I taught, I had, I had exemplary students. And then a couple of generals wanted to go to New York. I'll take you. I was in a Cessna 195, which is a large tailwheel aircraft, five people, and I flew those men to uh, New York, stayed a day, and came back. This Neil, 21-year-old kid, doing that. Then I stayed there for about a, a year at Oklahoma State, I mean at uh, Fort Sill, and another job opened up, and somebody wanted, this, this Sally Royals, who had gone to uh, Oklahoma State, was now in California. Wally, I want you to come to Wright's Flying Service in Hawthorne, California, because we need a chief pilot. So I was there for still for a year. I really kind of hated to leave, because I had, I had helicopters. I had all these wonderful things, but then California, I knew, was really busting open with aviation. So off I drove, my Vauxhall that my parents had given me for graduation, all filled up, went to Hawthorne, um, Hermosa Beach, California, 
and I spent some, I lived with Sally for a while and got my job and I was chief pilot at Rice Flying Service for over 10 years. Now, in between that 10 years, in 61-ish, Jerry Cobb, who was a very famous pilot back in those days, flying to uh, the jungle and worked for Aero Commander in Oklahoma City. Wally, we're doing astronaut testing at, Oklahoma, at uh, Albuquerque, Dr. Loveless. Do you want to do it? Yes! Write to him. I said, no, I'm going to, uh, oh shoot, what do you call it? Telegram him. I telegram him. I said, I'm Wally Funk. I'm very interested in the test that you're going to do. Put me on your list. He telegrams back and he says, you'll be back here in February. I was. Now, here's the catch. I went back home. I worked out hard because being born in high altitude, I had great lung power. I was, I was very well suited for athletics. My parents had to drive me from Taos to, uh, to Albuquerque because I was too young. <laughs> they had picked 25 girls and they all came and I'm the youngest. So I didn't qualify. My parents had to drive me and sign me in. And then of course the motel was across the street in Albuquerque from Lovis. Unfortunately, none of that, those things are still there and Jerry and I were lucky enough to go get our, all of our uh, paperwork from the doctors. So I, I have some of those. I went through a week worth of tests that you would never believe of what they can do to our body. Every orifice was checked, double checked, and something run through it except for our ears. And what they would do with our ears, I was strapped in a dentist chair and they injected 10 degree water. Now think about that. What's freezing? 32 degrees. This is 10 degree water for 20 seconds in your ear. Well, you just go all nuts. I didn't quite know what to think of all this because mother taught me if you get hurt when you're out there playing and you skin up your arms or your legs or whatever, you take care of it, put some grass on it, and go about your business. So pain was never part of our family. So I thought, well, okay, throw it a fish. We want you to go over to this room and wait for an hour and then we'll call you. And then I heard screams and yells because they were doing it to other people. But I never yelled. I just went like that. So my time came again. They strapped me back in. And I know, oh, here it comes again. <laughs> you cannot help. You cannot stop your body from being active. So that was, that was one test. They had given me two little white cups. They I said, this is for urine and this is a stool. So I take it back to my motel. Oh, okay, I mm, don't know what that is. I did the urine, and about three days later, the nurse came up and said, Wally, you haven't given us that other, uh, the stool. I said, I don't know what that is. A stool for me was when I was sitting on a stool milking cows as a kid. And then she explained. I said, you don't want that, do you? I said, uh, they said, yes, we can tell a lot about that. So I did that the next day. Well, they all got a big kick out of it because I thought it was a stool that you sat on. Okay. Oh, I learned a lot. <laughs> they would put me in a... Uh, a thing in Los Alamos to see how much radiation I had. It was a very skinny trough. It was no big deal. You just laid there. Some of the girls just were all out of shape. You had a little chicken switch. If you didn't like it, you'd go out. There was no room around. You could just, you could feel your breath. 
And what it was doing was measuring the radiation in our body. And mine came out exactly right smack on the line where it should be. The guys were way, way up here and the girls were way down here. On every test I took, and this is not bragosis, this was what Dr. Kilgore taught me, I achieved and beat everybody, the men, Murphy 13 and all the rest of them they had, more and did it better. And I said, okay, but I want to go to now, and that's why I want to go to NASA so bad. So anyway, phase one was all physical stuff. Our eyes were checked. Our teeth were all x-rayed. Every bone was x-rayed. Uh, things were stuck in you like, what's that for? I said, well, you don't need to know. <laughs> all right, so then it gets over with. My parents come pick me up. And then I said, okay, Jerry. Oh, uh, let me go back. I had a roommate for phase one. She didn't make it past two hours. Did you have much interaction with the other women during didn't this know time? Them. Did not know them, still don't know them. Did you talk to them? Did you see each other? No, no. We were only taken by ones or twos. Okay. So the girl that I was with, she was dismissed that noon, that, that Monday noon. Whatever happened, they didn't like it, so they dismissed her. Only 13 made it out of that bunch. I didn't know anybody but Jerry Cobb. So Jerry says, hey, you want to go to phase two? I said, yes. OK, she went down to Florida. Well, they wouldn't let me go because they decided they didn't want to really have all the girls come down there. So I made arrangements with different universities and places that I had known or had flown to go. So I went to USC and I said, you all have a centrifuge. Yes. May I take that centrifuge test? Yes. Well, being at Fort Sill and I'd flown the T-33, I knew that I had to have a, uh, help me, a, a piece of underwear that keeps all the fluids in you. Pressure oh, okay. suit? Pressure suit? Huh? A pressure suit? Pressure suit, thank you. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> excuse me, I asked mother, I said, mother, do you have a really old merry widow and two girdles? She said, yes. What are you going to do with those? I'm going to make a pressure suit. So I put that on, put the girdles here, merry widow here, and I went to USC, and they, you're sitting up at that point. So the astronauts later laid down. So the blood is going from here to here. So they went round, 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 and they were, the German people were there taking film of me doing this. I never even saw that. So they, I would be going round, 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 round for probably two or three minutes. And then they would stop it and rechange the camera. So we had four times they stopped it. And I said, you know, let me have it, give it to me. Each time I was having five Gs and then they went up to six Gs and I knew to hold that blood and X oxygen up in my head. I never felt anything. I never fainted. They did to other people that they had tried at USC, they were like, oh, they just fell over right away. So, being born in altitude helps and skiing at 12,000 helps. Okay, so that was one phase. Another phase was at El Toro Marine Corps in California, and that was the high altitude chamber test. Now, before I could do that, they wanted to put me in a parachute and send me up to 100 feet and see how fast I would come down with no parachute. I was just, so I put all this on. I, you know, my trust was very, <clears throat> 100%. I trusted what people were going to do to me. They weren't going to hurt me. So they put all this stuff on me and they shoot me up this, it's like hit, hitting the gong when you were a kid. Well, I went up and I hit the gong and then I came down with a crash. But I, I didn't break anything. But I had a magnitude headache. I said, wow, you do that to everybody? He said, oh yeah. And I said, well, I thought well, I was going to have a parachute. He said, no, we want to see what your body's going to do, the fluids are going to do, the oxygen's going to do, and how your brain is going to react. 
I said, okay, I got a really bad headache. He says, we're going to fix that. So they walked me over to the high altitude chamber test. And there's two doctors in there, and there's all these holes where a glass where you can see in all around. And would you believe there was a nose peering in at me through every one of those glass <laughs> holes? Because did, did I explain that well enough? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I, wow, this is kind of interesting. Why aren't they in here with me? So I have my oxygen mask on. And little by little, they take me up to 40,000 feet. Okay. My duties were to, if a red light came on, I'd push it off. If a green light, I'd put it off. If a white light came on, I'd put it off. Then I was to write things. Piece of cake. Can't they do anything more? So anyway, we did this for about 15 minutes, 40,000 feet. And they said, Wally, take your mask off. Okay. And they said, we want you to write your name across the clipboard you have. I thought, happily doing that. Of course, everything's filmed now. Everything I've ever done has always been filmed. So I'm writing my name, and I, well, this is boring. And I would look around, boring. And pretty soon they said, uh, I, I barely heard it in the background, but I didn't react. Wally, put your mask on! Wally, put your mask on! Finally, somebody slapped it on me. And you all came out clear. What was happening is my blood and everything was not allowing vertigo, not letting me see. And I, I was, I don't think I was strapped in, I was just sitting there. I thought, wow, what a difference oxygen makes. Now, I had flown uh, people at in Hawaii over the big volcano, and I got up to 14,000, and people got very quiet. And I noticed their fingernails got a little blue and their lips got a little blue. Uh, oh, oxygen. So I knew never to go above 14. But we were higher. So there's the law now that you can't go past 12,000. Anyway, they showed, they, they, they came in after I got squared away. Oh, when it, when it came time to push those buttons out, I guess I wasn't hitting the right buttons either. So they showed me the film. I wasn't hitting the right buttons. And then they showed me, you know, you thought you were writing really perfect, and you were writing clear over here. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, wow, that's interesting. So I said, okay, now I know what a lack of oxygen does. And the astronaut, NASA, hadn't really thought about laying people down because you only want the, the, the blood to go from here to here instead of from here to here. Okay. That was one phase. Then I was sent to Oklahoma City where they put me in a tank. Well, you're with a lot of psychologists. They're asking you your whole life which I thought, well, okay. How are my grades? Uh, they asked me all kinds of questions, which I don't really, really remember. Mm -hmm. And uh, they asked me one question. So what question that, did they ask you? So after a whole bunch of other questions, they said, who wrote Nambuco? I said, there you. You could see their mouths drop, and they stopped the questions. How did you know that? I said, because my parents took me to the opera every year in Santa Fe, and when I was a youngster, I would put pots and pans on a dining room table with forks and knives and spoons, and I would play to the orchestra and to the opera that was playing on the recorder, and I was the conductor, and I was playing on the table. And at Stevens, I was in the Burl Symphony Orchestra, and I played in the orchestra with percussion instruments, and that also opened another door where I got to go to the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra and play with them. And I've had opera in all my life. And even when you go to Stevens, and I mean at um, uh, Oklahoma State, 
they don't know what opera is there. It's all other stuff. And of course, today people don't really know too much of opera. But I play it and I love it. And I wanted to be, I've had several of my friends be opera singers at um, the Met. And I wanted to be a Met conductor <laughs> because part of music was me. But aviation took over. So what happened after the Oklahoma City testing? I'm sorry? What happened after the testing in Oklahoma City? What did they do next? Oklahoma City, okay. Oklahoma City, I had a barrage of all these mm -hmm. questions. Then they said, bring your swimsuit tomorrow because you're going to be in a tank of water. And Jerry had told me, you're going to be in a tank of water. They're going to see what your body's going to do because they're going to take a lot of things away from you. Mm -hmm. so, okay, I'm game. So I had all these test questions, got in there, and I'm in a tank of water, climbing in, and they had um, a piece of foam rubber about this size behind my neck and behind my back. That's all I had to keep me afloat. Jerry had one of those things that you have for the airlines. I didn't. I got in the pool. And I thought, well, this is interesting. I slapped the water. Couldn't feel it. Couldn't feel it. Couldn't feel it. All the time, they were testing me with questions, thermometer was in my mouth to get my mean temperature of my body. And what they did was they took the temperature of the room, temperature of the water, and the mean, uh, another temperature, another thing that they took, and it was my mean temperature to where I couldn't feel anything. It was like being, that was the closest they could do to be in space. <laughs> so they wanted me to stay in as long as possible. And I can't go on any further without you guys turning around and looking. The cows want us to come out and feed them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> they always come up at this time. Okay. So I'm, I'm not supposed to move. I'm just supposed to lay there. There's a mag, um, I mean a um, uh, uh, what you call it, that comes down to pick up my heart rhythm mm -hmm. and my breathing. They wanted me to talk and sing and tell stories. I didn't talk in those days. I was never to talk unless spoken to or to be answered. That's the way my parents brought me up. So I've come a long way. I can talk a lot right now. <laughs> so the microphone didn't pick up much. So I'm, I'm, I'm laying there, obviously, and here's, here's the microphone, uh, right here. I, of course, I didn't reach up to touch it. I couldn't touch anything. It was just the water. Man, it was very frustrating. You couldn't feel that. You couldn't even hear it. So after a while, they said, Wally, how do you feel? I said, I feel great. I said, well, you have to go to the bathroom? Are you hungry? No. We're going to turn the lights up very gently, take the earplugs out of your ears, get accustomed to your surroundings. I said, boy, you pulled one on me. I can't feel anything. You took all of the senses that we have away from me, didn't you? And why hit, hit him with it right away? They said, yes, we did. Now we want you to get toweled off, be careful getting out of the pool, and come on into the debriefing room. Well, as I went into the debriefing room, I noticed that there was a clock on the wall. I'm very aware of everything wherever I go. If I went to your home, I'd be very aware of everything. So, man, I can't wait to see that clock. So I went in at eight something that morning. I got the towel around me, started to go out, looked at the clock. They had covered it up. Well, smart. I had to go through some more debriefing. And had I changed my mind on any of the questions that they had asked me for two or three days, oh, 
Everything stayed the same. I didn't have to change my mind about anything. Now, I heard some of the girls had got divorces. They didn't like this. They didn't like that. They were going to do a better job with something else. I didn't have those types of thoughts. And at the end, they said, how long do you think you were in? I said, oh, I don't know, probably till noon. I said, you stayed in 10 hours and 35 minutes. I said, holy cow, that's incredible. I, I didn't feel it at all. Hmm. He says, you are a good candidate to go upstairs when the time comes. So that really gave me the, the proof that I wanted to. So those were the three phases. And so I've done everything I can do, go wherever I can. And I've been to Russia three times, and I got to go to um, Space Star City in 2000 and did everything that they gave the cosmonauts for a week, and I did well with them. And their suits, when you put their suits on, 200 pounds is what our suits and their suits are, but you get into our suits different than you get into their suits. So all the things that they gave me there were very, very similar to what I had in America. And of course, I was invited then to go to their space station, but unfortunately within that year, it had a problem and came burned up. What were your, your thoughts when the Mercury program yeah. It was by two people. Jackie Cochran could not pass the test that we went in. She nixed it. Jackie and I were very close. And I was just asked this question a week ago. And I'm not afraid to say it. She helped the WASP. She did a wonderful job. But she was too old to go through these tests. So it was she and one other congressman, when they went to their meeting in Washington that Jerry Cobb and Janie Hart went to, that's when they missed it. Mm -hmm. Well, I was heart sick, but I threw it a fish, and Father said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm still a cheap pilot. I'm going to go back flying. And I have an idea. I'm going to sell my Vauxhall, and I'm going to go overseas. Now, I don't know where I got this from, because a lot of my parents were, uh, went overseas on ships, <clears throat> whatever. And I'm going to fly over to Europe, and I'm going to see Europe. 24 years old, 24 to 26 to 28, something like that. So I bought a Volkswagen camper in Brussels, I flew to Brussels, I picked up the camper. Uh, hmm. Well, this is a great camper, but I need things to maybe boil water with. Uh, and I took my little poodle, Caniche Mignon, little toy poodle. And I would pick up people along the way that didn't have rides. It, camping and, and hitchhiking was a, no big deal. They, everybody did it in the 60s. So, with little Toot as a dog, all these women came around to look in this car to see this dog. And I said, oh, this is little Toot. She said, no, Caniche Mignon, little poodle. I said, I need covers, a pillow, eat. Ah, bon marché. They took me to the Bon Marche, which is like our Walmart. I bought everything I needed, outfitted the camper, and I started my trip. And that trip went on for three years, and I went to 59 countries. Wow. I was on three boats and ships with that camper, and I was in countries that you can't even go to today. I did all of Europe, uh, Iraq, Iran. I was even the um, guest of Halle Selassie. Mm -hmm. I don't remember how I quite got there. but And then I went across North Africa, oh, it's in, in Cairo for over a month and a half, because all I knew people, or father knew people. And the main thing I wanted to do was not only see Europe and all the arts, 
because a lot of the artists helped me get there too, is in Africa, South Africa, is see the gold mines and the diamond mines. I went to the diamond mines first in the capital, and that was really outstanding. You go down in an elevator, you're, you, you have to put all their, their garb on because you're down so low into the earth that your clothes would smell. And you could see where they were chipping out all these diamonds. Incredible. So I spent a whole couple of months in South Africa and staying with friends. I slept in my camper and their woman would bring out the food to me or I, I ate with them. Then when I was in Cape Town or in that area, I got to go into the gold mines. Same thing again. Put on your garb and you're on a tree and you're seeing where they're chipping out gold and all these pieces are being put on. It, it was outstanding. No child would have known how that is mined today. Mm -hmm. I didn't know how it was mined. All we know is it's in stores to buy. <laughs> now, one thing that I thought of that I did ahead of time is that I wrote to every um, cut. Who runs our, our countries in our behalf? Who runs our country in behalf of other countries? Um, the consulates? Uh, more. Embassy? Embassy. I wrote to every embassy of every country that I was going to in Europe, and I checked in. When I got on the train in Vienna, my parents had friends that knew the queen, the queen, and I stayed at the palace in Vienna. And then I got on the train, and I went to Moscow. And what was interesting along that route is that they had everybody come off the train and go away into the station and wait an hour and then come back and get your seats. And I had a place on all my own. I didn't have to share a seat. And I said, why did you do that? She says, because our tracks are smaller and other tracks in Europe are bigger. No train can come busting through Russia. Very interesting. <laughs> However, I didn't really know it at that time. I'm getting ahead of myself. So we get into Moscow. I've ridden to the uh, concert there, and I couldn't get a ride. I, you just don't talk to soldiers. The soldiers are on the streets with their guns. I got there at a time when it was Cold War. I wanted to meet Valentina on that trip. No, knit will not happen. <laughs> American astronaut candidate will never meet Valentina, who's gone up. So I didn't get a chance. But I ate very well. I went to the operas, the ballets, and it only cost 67 cents. And here we pay many, many dollars. <clears throat> so I was entertained because you had to prepay for a week. Okay, so I do all of that, see everything there is in, in Moscow. Then I get back on the train, and then I'm in a uh, companion apartment with two other men. See, the compartment I had, I was by myself. I said, uh, this is not going to work overnight. So I went up and down trying to find somebody that spoke English. Does anybody speak English on this train? <laughs> a girl stuck her head out and says, yeah, we do. Where are you from? Canada. Great. Uh, can I bunk with you guys? Yeah. Because their guy missed the train. So I was with two Canadian girls going that whole trip back to Vienna. <laughs> because I just... <laughs> when you saw these guys all bearded and they didn't smell too good, you didn't want to do that. Anyway, I got back to Vienna and got on my way with my camper, and then that's when I started going to Iraq, Iran, and all across Africa and so forth. And spent, oh my word, I spent a month and a half in Morocco and went way on down into, um, hmm. well, the next country down, and bought beads. They were called Phoenician beads, and they were 
That was money in old times. And they were very colorful and they were glass. And I was able to buy some and bring some home. And I have no idea what I'm going to do with them. I should have them out so you're going to see them. Phoenician beads. It was money back in these days. So I stayed at the camp in Agadir. And I saw all, all of them. Uh, that, that country was it's beautiful. I, I hope that things stay the same. I was on the water, uh, in, uh, beach. So if you needed a shower, you just went into the salt water. And that's, that's how you took a shower. You washed your clothes, washed your dishes. And of course, there were a lot of other Americans there. So it was kind of a fun time to be there. Wherever I went, there was always American campers. <laughs> and yeah. I had... What a great adventure. Oh, my God. When I talk about it now, and I'm probably leaving out about half of it talking to you because I really hadn't thought about it. Mm -hmm. So all those countries, I can show you maps, and, and I had very meticulously shown, every, shown myself or did it where I was every, every night. Well, when you came back to the States, what did you end up doing? Oh, well, so then finally, there was no communications letters. I sent my parents letters. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be a while. And then I get a letter. Uh, the people in Switzerland, was a colonel in the Swiss Army, they got my letters and then we sent letters. Mother says, when are you coming back? I said, I don't know. I'm having too good a time. She says, well, we have a lot of hippies here. I said, what's a hippie? She says, we can't explain it. You just have to see it for yourself. So when the time came that I did... Oh, I was in Africa, and I wanted to bring the camper home, but I couldn't. I couldn't sell it. I finally sold it. In fact, I gave it away in Kenya. I got a flight from Kenya. I have to look at the map to a place in Europe, and then flew home mm -hmm. across the the pole. Came back to California. Had my, had my job back. Mr. Wright said, well, I expected you just to be there for six months, and here you stayed away three years. I said, yeah. It was great. It, it was a, a, people are now doing the types of things that I did, but they're not seeing the beautification of the things I did, because all those countries have changed. Mm -hmm. You can't get into Iraq, Iran, and all the places across North Africa that I was in. Do you want to take a break and feed your cows, or are you okay? okay? Okay. And I want, to, I want, if you have mm -hmm. five minutes, I want to get that map out. Okay. Sure. That's fine. Yeah. It's very um, tender. Man, you're really, you're making me think about stuff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I do. Wally, you, you've been the first to do many different things. I think so. You have been the first, and, and one thing you were the first at, there's been many, uh, you were the first to complete the FAA General Aviation Operations Inspector Academy. That is true. And tell me how all that came about. Very interestingly, the 99s, who are women pilots from around the world, Jean's, Jean was one of my friends in California, in Palos Verdes. I wrote to her husband and said, would you write a letter for me because I want to go to Alaska and be a, a pilot up there. I want, to, I want to do, I want to see animals, what do you call, God, see? All right, what do you call when you, people want to go up to Alaska and go safari, mm -hmm. on safari. And so I, uh, Mr. Glenn calls me back and said, Wally, I want you in my office on Monday morning. I said, yes, sir. So I was. I was all dressed up, dress, heels, hose, walked into his office. Of course, I'd been in and out of there because I was chief pilot and I had to take my students in and out of there to get their written. So I knew all the people. But now I have to come in dressed up. So he said, I want you to have a seat. He queried me for probably two or three hours. And he says, I want to check with the people in Washington. I want you to be our first girl 
FAA inspector. I said, you must be joking. He says, no. Your duties would be to give written tests, give check rides, go on some accident investigations, and generally keep, keep aviation safe in all our airports. I said, but I don't have that kind of knowledge. He said, we will be sending you to different schools to get you that knowledge. Holy cow, I didn't realize that would even happen. He said, when can you start? I said, when do you want me? He said, next week. I said, yes, sir. I'll have to give people advance notice that I will, won't be at work. I'll be an FAA inspector. So I did, and right away they sent me to Oklahoma for school, a couple of weeks, learn how to do things. And it was easy. Being an investigator or being, being giving, given writtens, because I was giving my kids practice writtens. I was getting them ready for check rides that the FAA would give. So all this was very easy for me. So I did this for five years, and pretty soon I'm starting to know all the people in NTSB, and one guy says, uh, well, you write a really good report. I said, well, I've had some help. They said, well, we want you to come into our office and see us. So I did the same thing. We want you to become our first girl NTSB investigator and do accident investigations. You have to understand, I have never filled out an application for anything I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Things have been, doors have been opened. Mm -hmm. I have been a very, very lucky, I am very, I'm very lucky, I feel very, uh, I, I, I thank the people that put me into positions that I could excel into what I wanted to do in aviation. That's a tough job. Well, you know what, I didn't look at it that way. Yes, I, I was an accident investigator. Mm -hmm. I've done over 450 accidents. I can show you some pictures if you wish, but... I don't know if it means anything to you. Okay, how do I get to an accident? An accident happens and the FAA duty officer gets the call. Let's say I'm number one to go out. He calls me up, could be any time, day, night, whatever. Okay, your accident is in San Diego. Okay. In the first part of the days, we didn't have government cars. So I got in my car and I'd go down and maybe it was a small aircraft. It got into the water somehow. The engine quit and went in the water. We pulled it out of the water. I had it put on a lorry and brought up till we could check out the engine and what had happened. Half the time you don't get the truth out of a pilot mm -hmm. if they survive. So I did this for many, many years, 10 years. I had a lot of help from my secretaries to help me write reports because I would come home and on my electric typewriter, I would write out the reports that night and be able to hand my paper in for a preliminary as I went to work the next day. Now, that was only on small accidents. I've done some fairly large accidents as well. The largest, most famous accident was in, was in San Diego. And I got the call and they said, PSA just ran over a 150, a 172. I, oh, wow. Pull the tapes, I've got to hear everything. And I got in the car and went right down there. And that's what a picture would look like from a photographer that happened to be there just as the PSA wasn't paying attention and ran over a 172. Now, a 172 is a very small aircraft, that's what I teach in, for place. PSA is a 737, and the tower had said, PSA, you have traffic at three o'clock. PSA, you have traffic at 2 o'clock. Nothing. 
PSA, you have traffic at 1 o'clock. And one of the guys said, I think he went underneath us. Bang. And well, they're coming together like this. Bang, right there. Joint. That took out 20 blocks of homes. Wow. I was down there for two weeks. I got the all the aircraft of the 172 over to a hangar where I could go through it. Now, the people in the 172, one guy was under the hood doing instruments, but they were on different frequencies. They didn't hear what PSA was getting. When I went to the tower, I said, play me the tapes. Well, when I'd hear the PSA stuff, there were five voices in that cockpit. What do we have here? Three people flying the airplane and two flight attendants. Mm -hmm. People have come to me for days to do this particular accident. And unfortunately, the people that were interviewing me hadn't been born yet and didn't really know the truth. They went to the tower tapes. They never heard five voices. They didn't know what I had gone through to get all, can you imagine getting all of an airplane like this together in a big hangar, piece by piece? It's humongous. Mm -hmm. And I was the person in charge. People came from um, DC to help, but they don't have the people like they have today where they send out a go team immediately. Mm -hmm. I didn't have a go team. A couple of people came out and I said, I need an engine person, a structural person, a 37 person. And me. And that's how I learned to do things. So in all the accidents I've done, I've done two or three large aircraft, but they were on the ground uh, that did something silly, like the guppy. The guppy was coming in for a landing at Van Nuys, and oh my goodness, the uh, line for the hydraulics had fallen off, and he didn't have any brakes. So he, and he went to hit the brakes at Van Nuys, it didn't take, and it swerved right away to about five airplanes. They were uh, just uh, being, tied, uh, being tied down. So then I'm called. So, if, uh, NTSB wise, uh, every Friday night, you're either number one, number two, number three. So, number one always goes out. By Saturday, if they're there, they're lucky. Then number two takes over, they're number one. Number three is number two. I don't think, I think I was on number three. I didn't have to go out until maybe Monday or Tuesday because you kept that particular pattern the rest of the week. So when number three went out, came back to number one. Now we only had six people in my office. We only did aviation, but I, and I've done um, one railroad, mm -hmm. but they had railroad people, ship people, aviation people. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to get into those other areas, but I couldn't. And they sent me to school every three or four months to learn how to do things and know all the people in general aviation, Beach, Piper, Cessna, Mooney, and I could call on these people. Hey, I'm up at Bakersfield, can you meet me? I've got a Mooney up here. He ran off, something happened after takeoff, and I think it was fuel, but I'd like to have your opinion. <laughs> so, I've made a Wally stick, and it tells people how to pre-fly their airplane. There's a couple of things that are always going to happen in general aviation. Uh -huh. They didn't pre-flight correctly, they didn't check their gas, they didn't check their weather, they didn't check their body, and they didn't do everything they should with that airplane. I'll stand by them. While I was with NTSB and I saw all these accidents happening, I said, I have to invent something. This is called the Wally Stick. It's 
shown as to how many inches. And if you only have three inches of fuel, you don't go. If your airplane's full, you'll have seven inches. In a Mooney, you'll have eight inches. Then I signed each one of my sticks to somebody, and then I was selling them at many of the organizations where I was asked to speak. I've made thousands of these by hand. I'd find somebody's, uh, oh, I'd go buy a whole bunch of sticks, and then I'd just cut them, and then I would uh, sandpaper the edge, and then I'd, I'd make them. I would give the money to an um, organization I started for young girls to have the opportunity to win a solo scholarship. And it's happened. Uh, they're very popular. They, they were very popular at Oklahoma State. In fact, it's quite interesting, the guy that I was talking about at Ohio State, you bang on the propeller because <clears throat> you want to hear a, a high ping at the end and a dead thud at the, where the engine, where it attaches to the engine. If you don't have a high ping out at the edge, you got a crack. I've had several airplane accidents where a crack has made a part of a uh, uh, propeller come apart or come off. I've had several accidents where people didn't know the magnetos were on and accidentally hit the propeller and the thing would spin and they'd lose their head or their hands. I mean, it's, it's, it's an interesting kind of a uh, job, but the Wally stick is a well and live, and wherever I go, I have my bag full of Wally sticks, which has been fun. It's, it's taught a lot of people to stay safe. Well, through the years, something you've continued to do for your entire career is teach people. Oh, of course. So could you, could you kind of touch upon that? I mean, I, I assume you're still instructing uh, people yes, today. Yes, I've got three, four students right now. Um, back up. After I came back from Europe and I was at Oklahoma, I was at uh, California, I was asked to come different places to, to be a chief pilot, whether it be in Ohio, Illinois, Miami, here. When, in Mi when the, the hurricane hit my, my, Miami, uh, I flew for an insurance company to see how many bodies we could find in the forest, the Indians. There were a lot. Press didn't tell it correctly. Anyway, there was an opportunity for me to come here to Grapevine, actually, with one of my students who was with American, and they said, Wally, why don't you get out of Miami and come up here and teach? So I've been here since, oh, late 80s and started out here at, at Grapevine. I was over at uh, Trophy Club for a long time when I was fixing that house up, but I've always been the chief pilot over here at Northwest Regional. And you would have passed Northwest Regional when you said 1171. I was very impressed by the fact that you knew where 1171 was. Because <laughs> that's, if you would have looked over to the left, you would have seen, no, it's, well, it's not good, but that's where my airport was. How many students would you estimate you've taught over the years? 3,500. Wow. I've got over 19,000 hours of flying time. Mm. And you can't find, I don't think, a captain. I've never, and, and I, don't, I don't say that unless I'm asked. I have never heard of a captain say that he's had over maybe 13, 14,000 hours. Mm -hmm. Because they have their time off. I fly every day. This is the only day this whole week and next month that I'm not flying because you were coming. And you got the slot on my calendar before Sydney did. <laughs> <laughs> How long are you going to keep flying? Forever? Already? <laughs> long time, 40 years from now. All right. <laughs> no, I, I'm, I'm in perfect health. Every time I go for physical, he says, you never change. You always look young. I said, yes, sir. And I tend to stay that way. Well, something I definitely want to talk a little bit about is space travel today. This is something you've been very interested in. Could you kind of talk about 
where you are with all of it. Right now, I'm, I paid my dues to Sir Richard Branson with Spaceship Two and White Knight Two. Unfortunately, in November, White Knight Two crashed. The guy pulled the wrong lever and it brought him down. That was, that hurt. And unfortunately, what was so funny about that one, not funny, I was on my way to Branson, Missouri, because I always go uh, zip lining and to some of the theater things in November, and that's when that happened. So when they called, the press called, because ABC, NBC, BBC, they all know my numbers, they all call me. So two were calling me on my phone. What do you think? I said, I am shocked. The guy pulled the wrong lever. I am so sorry, because that's going to delay my trip. Right now, they called and said, we're about three-fourths finished making a second spaceship two. However, it's going to take a couple of years to see if it's going to do what they want it to do. I hope they won't be so long. So that's one, one ship that I want to go in. And that's uh, the large one is Spaceship Two, and the little one is, um, I mean, uh, White Knight Two and Spaceship Two. Mm -hmm. So when this leaves, the little one leaves, it goes on up into space. Um, then I've been interviewed by a company out in El Segundo that is now putting goods and services up to International Space Station. With, at, uh, I, can't, I can't tell if it's a little bit with the Russians, because you don't know what to believe, or if it's just all of the consortium in America at the Cape. They're sending food and clothes or whatever they need up there. Well, one crashed a month ago, so they never got their stuff. So we're not all, all ready for that. The Russians have had very good luck. Their vehicle can go through all the junk that's around Earth and get up to ISS, International Space Station, within six to eight hours hmm. and carry everything there. But there's not people. So when I was interviewed by one of the companies that's in, in um, they're trying to beat each other out, they said, we will not be going up till 17, 2017, and it's going to take $22 million. So when I was in New York, as one of their guests, had my cards ready, wanted to give people, I wanted to get some sponsorship. But being on the stage, they took us out one door, and all the people that I wanted to get to went out another door. I never got to meet them. If it's meant to be, it will come. It will happen. They all know, through people like you, it will spark somebody's interest. What would it mean to you to get up in there? Oh, I'd be the happiest kid in the world. <laughs> <laughs> I've done some really great things. I've been very happy with my life. I have no regrets. None. And I will keep doing that. But as you can probably tell, I'm just a happy kid. I just could go out there and do anything. So I'm just waiting for the time that that might happen. Can you talk a little bit about your involvement with the 99s? Well, the 99s is a wonderful organization to be with. Um, to be a 99 when I was in the 50s, early 50s, no, sorry, late 50s, was at Oklahoma State. You had to be dressed. You had to attend three meetings, and you had to be voted upon. And you had to have a private license and medical and so forth. I had all that. So I was voted upon to come on in, and they gave me the nice 99 pin. Well, this is it right here with the wings. Nine within the nine. Started in 1929, and our headquarters is in Oklahoma City. 
uh, that was great because being a 99 and going overseas opened a lot more doors. That was an excellent question, thank you. And some of those people were 99s there. I have sponsored many people into the 99s. There was a girl that came from Pakistan just four or five months ago. I met her getting a 777 scholarship from Delta. And I said, I will sponsor you into the 99s, into International Society of Women Pilots. And I have done that. She's been, and right now she is in 777 school. And very, very happy. And uh, you know what? I don't, I don't, nobody gave me any of those chances, but I want to give somebody else the chance of doing something and spreading their wings. Well, walking around your home, you have lots of accolades and recognitions and awards. <laughs> and we could probably go on and on for hours. But I do want to talk about um, in 2010, you were inducted into the, into the OSU Aviation Hall of Fame. Surprise. <laughs> What, what kind of honor was that for you? That was so fantastic. Um, oh, excuse me. Uh, not only to go back home, they honored me by giving me this trophy, June 4th, 2010. And it has stayed there all this time and anybody that I talked to there, and I got an invitation to come back. I think you just had that award last week or two weeks ago for the people that they nominated. So, uh, you're here. <laughs> and it was great coming back, and I'll, I'll continue to come back, especially when NIFA will, will be in power, and you've got to be sure to let me know. Well, something I've noticed, and, and you may notice it as well, um, whenever you meet a flying Aggie alum or an OSU alum, uh, there is a, uh, a, a bond and a loyalty. Yes. What do you think brings about that? It's the way we all were. We all loved each other. We were all doing the same thing. Even though we were uh, competing against each other, but we were still there. That is different then flying a lot of the Illinois, Ohio, they were all for themselves. There's something about OSU from the very beginning that was a great bond, and I felt that when Father took me there by the instructors that I had. Mm -hmm. And President Burst, he, when I was looking for you, I said, call him and tell him that I send my love. And you all do the same. <laughs> what advice would you give Flying Aggies today? What would you tell them? Oh, my word. The world is open, but you have to figure out how you want to make it better for yourself to have other people follow you. Because some people are lost out there. They don't know how to dress. They don't even use English correctly. They, I have, they know how to fly airplanes. But there's much more that goes along with being a flying Aggie than just flying an airplane. And because of my parents, I have always presented myself the way that they would want me to. And I was going to talk about trophies. Mm. Yes, I have so many in New Mexico, but I've given most of them to the 99s in Oklahoma City. So you can, you can go there to the museum on a Saturday and they'll, I guess I've got a great big box they can pull out. But uh, I miss not having my trophies, but I, I don't, I've moved so many times, I don't have room for them. I just got two pictures from Taos two days ago, and it's just really nice to, to see some of the art that I have missed. Any, 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 any of the honors in particular that really spark memories for you? Whew. <laughs> Every time they've awarded me something, yes, uh, the Oklahoma State Award, the Women in Aviation Award, uh, 99's Awards, um, boy, 
You're going to make, make me think on that one for a while. <laughs> but every, every time I've done something, it's just, it's been great. I've loved it. Uh, and I don't care about really awards. It's just being there and helping others because I'm finding that when I go to elementary, even junior high schools, one of the best schools that I was taken to in Reno, the kids didn't have any computers on their desks. They had to learn to write correctly, spell, and speak, and read. I was elated because I was staying with a family, three kids, and each kid had a book in their hand all the time around the house except for eating. Uh, the parents were fantastic. This umbrella of parents, of, of their kids, they're not teaching them. They're with their toys. Mm. And I hate the toys. I wouldn't have any in the airplane. And if you come to my dinner table and you're on your toy, I'll ask you to put it down. Because it's not nice. It's not, not the way things should be. I might be a little old fashioned, but you don't have to be on your toy when you and I are talking. And I just came back with some people. We were talking and having a conversation and they're I said, how could you, well, of course it's multitasking, but, and I do that in an airplane, and I'm not used to doing any of this stuff because I don't have the equipment. I can't afford it. I'm on a flight instructor's salary, which is very little. What's the best technological improvement in an airplane you've seen over the years? Well, glass, glass cockpit. Okay. However, I can't teach glass because I want the kids, it's not that I don't know how, I want the kids to know round dials. If a lightning would have hit an aircraft that had glass. Now all our airplanes are very, big ones are, are equipped so that lightning can't get to them. But smaller aircraft like 172 that has all, I don't know if you know what glass is, it's, it's, a, it's a panel that looks like this and it has all kinds of thing, information in it. If it were to get struck, the airplane would get struck by lightning and knock all that stuff off. There's not the little round dials that tell you what your airspeed is your uh, heading, your compass, uh, your RPMs that we need today. <laughs> so I'll have some fathers come up and say, you teach my, my child uh, so-and-so? I said, only if it has round dials. I don't do glass. They go get glass after they get their pride. Plus the fact, I'm not real sure, I know, how to, I know how to fly glass because of some of the airplanes I've been in and simulators, but it's really not my thing. The kids get a better knowledge. When you're tr coming in for a landing and you can just glance over to the airspeed indicator and tell if you're okay to come in and land. You don't want to be messing around by looking at anything on the glass. Now, all our airline people They've got a whole panel of glass for the pilot, a whole panel for the first officer. And I have a lot of my students. That, my students have all gone to the airlines or to the military, most of them. And they'll tell me what they've got on their glass. And I said, take a picture of it for me. I'm amazed. And they've got to learn it quickly. How they don't get things mixed up. They're all these up and down things. <laughs> if you ever go flying, ask the Captain, if you can see the cockpit, and then you'll see the big sheet of, of it'll be dark for you, glass. What's your favorite aircraft to fly? That's Stearman. I wish I hadn't sold it. Stearman, when I bought it, I could do loops, rolls, spins, and that's what I got known as. It was the only girl that had a bi-wing airplane. I sat in the front, and I instructed and could do acrobatics, and I taught all that to myself. Now, on the field was also a, uh, AT-6, 500 horsepower. Uh, I, wanted, I couldn't find anybody to check me out in it. I said, okay, I'm going to taxi up and down the, ta the runway. So I called the tower and I said, I'm going to be taxiing back and forth if you will allow me to do that. 
so I could get the feel of the airplane, because it, it was big, tail wheel. So uh, this one particular day, I put the mechanic next to me, and I said, okay, we're going to take off. Don't let me overspeed, because you can't overspeed on the RPMs on that particular airplane. And you, cannot, you don't want to spin it, because you might not get it out. Because I've done so many spins in my life. I got down to the runway, did the run up, and took it off, and man, it was great. Yahoo! Got it up, and then all of a sudden, my God, well, he didn't think about getting it back down on the ground. So I went out over the ocean and practiced a few maneuvers and some stalls and turns and so forth. Called the tower. He said, okay, enter on a downwind, Hawthorne and we'll call your base and final. And I said, you know what, I didn't even think about landing this airplane. <laughs> but it has the same nomenclature as the Stearman. So I brought it right on in and put it down on the runway. It's just like i have been in it. <laughs> and then over there was the DC-3. I'm going to get checked out in that DC-3. Nobody to check me out. So I got another mechanic. I did the same thing. This was two years apart. Back and forth, back and forth. Took the DC-3 off. Man, it was heavy. Ugh, it was heavy. But I trimmed it up correctly, got it off, went out and did maneuvers, came back around, got it on the ground. It was great. I did, just had that knack. Hmm. Just like you have that knack of what you're doing. <laughs> Anything, John? No. I'm just absorbing. <laughs> Any fear? Oh, no. We were not allowed to have fear growing up. My parents never had any fear. My mother was the, in all the Illinois, what would you call it, top woman in the city? Uh, she did everything. She belonged to all the organizations. Her parents did. Mother flew at 16 in all the Illinois. Really? She was, you know, in those days they had little uh, schoolhouses in the middle of fields. Mm -hmm. And here comes this barnstormer and landed right next to her schoolhouse. Mother shot out of that house and went over and said, I want a ride. He says, well, I need a dollar a minute. She went back and she got ten dollars. Here you are. She got in like a skirt and all, and the guy, I said, well, Mother, and I didn't know this for a long time. What did you do? She says, well, I've been up with you. So he did a loop, he did a roll, and some other maneuvers, and came in and landed. So I followed her footstep as well. And so everything I wanted to do in aviation, whether it was Big airplanes, little airplanes, air races, took her on air races. She was right there with me. She's right there with me right now, listening to us. Well, I'm glad we're, we're back around to your parents. We started the interview with your parents. Could you tell me their names? Virginia and Lozier, L-O-Z-I-E-R, Funk. And could you tell me uh, what your parents did in Taos? Father owned a 5 and 10 cent store. And I say 5 and 10, people don't know what I'm talking about. There are no more 5 and 10s around. They said, 5 and nick, no, 5 and dime. No, it was called 5 and 10. There's one left in America. It's at Branson, Missouri, 5 and 10. So I like to go in there because they had all the little nicky nacky things. And the reason I like to go to daddy's store, he said, do you ever want to work here? And I said, well, I might try the candy area because I'd like candy, but I didn't like money, didn't like to feel the money. I could be out there with grease and changing oil, but I didn't like the feeling of money. Whatever. So that's where all the airplanes came from. His father would order all these bolsa wood, different airplanes in those days. And that's before plastic, now I'm not going to get up again, but I have a whole bunch of plastic airplanes. And uh, I, there's, there's no balsa wood airplanes that have to, to make anymore, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. I, I can't express 
what those were, and there was no pictures. Mm -hmm. And when I left to go to Stevens, my room was disbanded because I never came back. I mean, I came back, but mother had done other things with my room. So, um, what's retirement going to be like for you? <laughs> never. <laughs> I'm still going. <laughs> now, I did retire from NTSB, but that was a, that was official for them. But I've kept on going. Mm -hmm. No, as long as I have an airplane, a company, I'm chief pilot. So you're still teaching. Uh, do you still actively speak across the country? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I'm about two a month. Wow. I have one on Monday. Mm -hmm. And then locally, I'm known, and I have two or three locally, and then I have four or five more trips to do in the next two months. Mm -hmm. Then I'll be going somewhere. Wow. Forest of Friendship in Atchison, Kansas. Um, I have to look at my calendar. <laughs> A sign of a busy person. <laughs> well, when, when history is written about you, how do you want people to remember Walter Funk? That's your thing. I just, I just love aviation. And I just like to turn people on. I bet I could get you in an airplane in five minutes. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> but uh, it's just been a, a joyous, joyous life for me. I've never had a bad day. Well, you've definitely had an amazing career, which we've only scratched the surface of. Um, but is there anything else you'd like to add before we close on out? Oh, gosh. I, I don't even know where to begin except um, I'm so happy you both came, and I'm happy this is going to my old school at Oklahoma State. And I, you're gonna want some more, because there's a lady that met me, and she says, man, I, I latched on to you right away. She's from, she said, North Carolina. I'm gonna be bugging you and bugging you because I'm gonna come and film you, write your story, and I said, that would take a year. You would have to follow me around. Because I have three different speeches I give. Now I'm giving a speech to the church. It's called Whitechapel Church up here. That's where I go to church. They want me to speak at 9 o'clock Sunday. And my normal speech is my life. And then I have an eight minute film of what I did in Russia in Star City with the cosmonauts. And that's kind of how I end it. However, yeah. sorry about the glasses, that cheaters when I do this. When I am about to finish, Oh, when I first start my speeches, I talk about Taos and jumping off the bar and so forth. And I also say I owe much of my success to the guidance and love my parents gave me as a little girl throughout my career and my life. They encouraged me to meet whatever crisis came along with utter determination. And then I end... I also, during, during, I also tell them what I'm about. I'm impulsive, spontaneous, practical, bold, complex, precise, very responsible. I'm a risk taker without being hurt. I'm tough on students. I never stop. And I march to my own drummer. And I talk about all the women in in space and in aviation that have been overcome by the press. I, I finish up by saying, please know that you're given a great gift of confidence. Get it and use it, but you have to find it. I'll say to the people, we only have to remember the only thing a woman needs to compete in a man's world is ability. 
because you can imagine all this stuff that I get. Okay, then I say, would you all put your heads down and close your eyes, and I want you to go to somewhere in your mind to one of the neatest places you've ever been to, whether it's a mountain or a stream, whatever, and think about what I'm going to say. I am but a footprint on the earth, a wing against the sky, a shadow in the water, a voice beneath the fire. I'm going on one footstep at a time and going on. Thank you very much for having me. That's it. That's the end of my speech. I think that's a great way for us to end today. Thank you. Wally Funk, you are an amazing woman. <laughs> <laughs> we really appreciate it. Here, here. <laughs> well, you've, you've met lots of neat people. I have, but I must say, you are quite amazing. Well, thank you, honey. <laughs>